All right. We are here with our next QA session with Jiska and Francisco for the Spectra uh, wireless, new wireless escalation targets uh, talk. Um, do you guys want to give yourself a little bit of an intro? Um, Jiska, you want to start? Yeah, uh, okay, then I start. Um, <laughs> I'm a postdoc at TU Darmstadt in uh, Germany at the Secure Mobile Networking Lab. And I've been, yeah, recently working a lot with Bluetooth. Before, I've been working also um, a bit on Wi-Fi and IoT devices and all sorts of wireless communication. Hi, I'm Francesco Ringoli. At the, I'm a system professor at the University of Brescia and have been playing with wireless technologies uh, in the last 15 years. That's great. Uh, thank you both. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I'm going to start off with uh, some a uh, little bit simpler questions. Uh, so, you talked a lot about this uh, uh, this new vulnerability that's between the two cores. Is, is this something that can be patched? It's hard to say. So, um, there are parts that definitely are not patchable because they are uh, for the performance improvements. So, the stuff that goes like uh, between the U code that Francesco modified and uh, the communication with the serial interface on the Bluetooth side. This is something that you need, at least if you don't want to lose performance. And this is also all in hardware, I guess. So this is something like in, in a future chip, it might be changed in a way that you can inter uh, infer less information, but uh, it's probably not patchable in that sense or not easily patchable. Um, the shared RAM is something that they should remove, but I didn't see them remove it yet. And I don't know if they can actually unmap it in the generation of chips or if this also needs a new generation of chips. I didn't see the shared RAM actually being used anywhere. So that's the, the weird thing, right? Mm -hmm. The shared RAM Still present, uh, exists. But... Yeah, so it exists, but it's really not being used for anything or at least for nothing that I could see. Mm -hmm. um, so this this is the thing that they should remove because it's the most dangerous part. Uh, so we got a question from uh, Cooper Q, uh, and this was actually something that I was interested in as well. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, LTE is on some of the same frequencies, and I know that there are some all-in-one chips that include LTE as in, in addition to their Bluetooth and wireless stacks. Um, have you tried going through the LTE baseband or uh, use the Bluetooth interface to get at the, the LTE radio? Um, not yet. So what we tried is, or we, we tried to see if this connection exists at all. And I can tell that in the Cypress Bluetooth symbols, there's definitely like symbols that are called LTE or MWS something. And then I also um, took some logs on an iPhone and like iPhone 7 and newer. And on those devices, what you can see is that there are HCI commands. So that's from the operating system Bluetooth daemon to the chip that include MWS, which is the configuration for the LTE coexistence. So they are definitely using it. I just didn't try to exploit it yet. Cool, fair enough. Um, this one, this one's one I, I'm going to, I'm gonna have to read verbatim because it's a little out of context. I don't know what, what it was. Uh, in the talk, you mentioned Frankenstein. Can you talk a little bit about hmm. it? Yeah, so that's another uh, paper. So, um, Actually, the main work of this is from Jan, who is not uh, here, but that's one of my uh, former students. And he um, made some snapshotting for Bluetooth chips of Broadcom and then also emulation. And the interesting part about this emulation is that it includes uh, thread switches and a virtual modem so that you can attach it to your Linux host and you actually can start scanning for devices and get back random devices. So you have like a full stack uh, emulation in that sense. Um, and this is something that we are going to present next week at USENIX Security. Oh, uh, the paper is already public. And cool. also the the software is uh, on GitHub since a while. Cool. Uh, could you uh, send me links for that uh, information? Ah, uh, you, can do it, yes. you can do it after, after the Q&A. I just want to be able to drop it in track one for anyone that's interested in following up with that All additional right. information. Uh, so mm -hmm. any, anyone that's paying attention and if you want the, the extra information, the links to the uh, the paper and uh, everything else will be in the track one uh, room as soon as this is over. Um, 
Okay, uh, on to the next question. Um, so regarding the uh, CVE 2019-15063 denial of service, it's a Bluetooth Wi-Fi exploit. Uh, is, is that, was that the specific one that you guys were working on? I, I don't remember CV numbers off the top of my head. Uh, anyways, mm -hmm. uh, the question is, uh, how are you manipulating the register that results in crashes? Are you physically accessing the chipset or can this be done remotely? Uh, so yeah, that's, so it's kind of two stages, right? So you first need some remote code execution, either on Wi-Fi or on Bluetooth, and then you could write to the register. And what we do for debugging is, uh, actually, so for, uh, Bluetooth, when we modify Bluetooth, then we have internal Blue, which is a framework that supports the vendor specific commands from Broadcom to man manipulate the Bluetooth part. And for Wi Fi, there's another thing next month. I think Francesco te can, can tell a bit more about next month. Yeah, it's a project that allows people to do binary patching of the wireless uh, driver so that uh, you can modify and then add functionalities, but uh, of course this is not a remote execution, it's just for modifying the binary image without having access to the source code, which is proprietary. And this allows to modify both the ARM, the ARM core, and also the U-code part, that is the lowest uh, part uh, accessible in the hardware. That's really cool. Is that uh, a tool that is gonna get released, like is it, uh, upcoming, is that the part of the Usenix talk, or? Uh, no, All next right. one is, no. I just pasted it also in our private chat so you can okay. copy it later. Uh, next one is something, uh, since when is it public? I don't know, 2016, 17? Yeah. A long time ago. Yeah. Well, and, and the interesting part about next one is, so next one was just built to actually modify the Wi-Fi firmware, um, without the intention to really hack it. So like more for sending arbitrary signals, turning your smartphone into an SDR. And the interesting part here is that back then in 2017, actually, Google Project Zero and Nitai Alkenstein used this knowledge to um, dig a bit further into the Broadcom chips. So like Broadpone and stuff like this was also not, not only, but also based on Nextmon and also later work, uh, they always used Nextmon. Uh, so that's a very interesting thing about this. And then for the Bluetooth stuff, we said like, okay, then we, if others use it for exploitation, we can also do exploitation on uh, our own. That's cool. uh, how do you guys go about uh, researching phones since uh, for the most part, everything seems to be closed source. Um, we're asking to talk about like the research process, like if you were going to try and exploit a new phone. Ah, uh, yeah, so that's, that's the thing. So the first part is, um, I mean, if you don't have already have a working over the air exploit, which is hard to get, especially if you don't have the ROM of a device and so on, even if you had an exploit, like getting it working on a new device would be hard. Um, so usually we start with a rooted smartphone or a jailbreak, um, or I mean, also MacBooks have Broadcom chips. So, and there you are already root. Um, so it depends a bit. And then we would dump the ROM and the ROM, I mean, for Wi-Fi and for Bluetooth, it's pretty much the same. And for Wi-Fi, the ROM also contains the U-code and the U-code is the thing that runs in the D11 core. So what Francesco modifies and for me, it's more the Bluetooth firmware. Um, and then it's very annoying because like the stuff is still without any symbols and especially Bluetooth also doesn't have any debug strings. The U-code doesn't have any debug strings. The Wi-Fi firmware has a few debug strings. Um, and since this is like, so even the memory layout is somewhat unknown and you need to guess it and so on. And because of this, it really uh, horribly loads into IDA. So it, it really looks ugly. Yeah, fair. And I think Francesco for you, uh, it's fair. even the case. That yeah, for, a, for a U code, right? yes, for a U code, uh, there is no actually correspondence between uh, the U code and the any known CPU. So uh, we had to uh, do this uh, reverse engineering for understanding the meaning of uh, this uh, instruction set, and then uh, adding instructions because Broadcom in, during the years added new instructions. And uh, yeah, the reason this was very difficult because it's not ARM that you decompile or disassemble, but uh, you have to develop your own tool chain on this. Which, so uh, what helped is that Broadcom didn't change much the platform uh, since uh, uh, they introduced it uh, 
15 years ago. Mm -hmm. So they are additionally adding instructions. And also what helps is that the U-code is very short, is less than 64 kilobytes. So. Uh, have you either of you uh, looked into any of the uh, newer like mesh Bluetooth protocols? Uh, Bluetooth mesh. So a colleague of mine did that, Lars, and he looked into the friendship together with a few other people in our team. So it's uh, so yeah, we did that in our team. But the mesh is not really interesting. I mean, it's just using Bluetooth LE advertisements. So from a at least from a lower level perspective, it's. Uh, nothing special i mean of course implementations on top are interesting then but uh i mean i do a lot of lower layer stuff um he just showed that the encryption and so on in the uh in the friendship of groups is broken and bluetooth sick uh, send funny responses of course it is um someone yeah. else is uh is shouting out that um uh, a lot of your uh, and related work on BLE is also available as preprints from YSEC 2020. Um, and mm -hmm. they, they also threw, threw a link in there. I just wanted to shout that out. Um, yeah, Francesco also has done stuff with Bluetooth sniffing, right? You built a Bluetooth sniffer. Yeah, this real-time sniffer using a software-defined radio for capturing all the channels at the same time and GPU for decoding and brute forcing. Uh, uh, lowest address part address and low energy session ID. Yeah, I, I know that there's a lot of like kind of a wide range of like capabilities of SDR stuff. Is there like a minimum requirement for the SDR hardware to do that level of sniffing and um, for Bluetooth? Well, uh, if you have SDR that can sniff 80 megahertz, it's better. Mm -hmm. But for sniffing uh, Bluetooth Classic, we demonstrated that if it's enough to capture only 16 channels out of 80, then you can also use uh, one of these cheap uh, SDR like uh, like uh, Hacker F or Blader F. So you do not need to buy a very expensive uh, thousand of euro 80 megahertz, but you can buy one of these for 100 bucks. Yeah, that, that's awesome. It should work. Yeah, accessible hacking. <laughs> it's nice. Um, yeah. Got one person uh, asking, do you think uh, Broadcom is relying a little bit too much on security through obscurity with some of these chips? I mean, so what you can actually see, and that's an interesting development. So um, the first bug that Jan discovered with Frankenstein is one in the enhanced inquiry response. And when he submitted that one, they said, we already know the bug and we just didn't find it anywhere. And then I got like the newest Samsung Galaxy S10e and extracted the ROM. And this one actually had a patch and it had a compile date of uh, April 2018. And that also means like they cannot change the ROM. So they cannot tell us lies about the ROM. Mm -hmm. And we reported it afterwards. So that actually means um, they knew it before. But and now that's the interesting part of the story. Um, they didn't patch it backwards in the older devices because it was not publicly known as a bug and you could easily unroll the patches. Um, now, the thing is, they definitely increased the security, um, I would say, after uh, the bugs in 2017 were public. So, I mean, it took them a year probably to do some pen testing and so on, but you can see like 2017, the first public incidents happened. 2018, the first kind of secret patches make it into the firmware. And also they started using like, I don't know, stuff like uh, secondaries. They didn't have it before. Um, so this is things that now are uh, going into the firmware. It's still not like super perfect and everything. It's still, of course, closed source. But I mean, most firmware in wireless chips is closed source. Yep. Uh, yeah, so at least they are trying to work on it. Um, and I think they are aware on that like security by obscurity doesn't really work. Fair enough. Uh, another, <clears throat> so uh, someone is asking uh, if anyone, if the, where people could find the source code for that Bluetooth sniffer. Francesco, I think that's Yeah, right. I you, can send you, yeah, yeah, yeah I can you, send you a link. If you send me a link, I will, I will, I will post that with everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. Um, sure. And another one, uh, do you think a Bluetooth or Wi-Fi based worm is feasible in the wild or is interoperability between implementations too difficult to bridge? Uh, so um, I think for Wi-Fi it's hard because for most stuff you need to actually join an access point or something like this. 
but for Bluetooth, you have this master slave mode. So you can actually have a device like a smartphone is usually capable of being master and slave. Some like cheap devices, cheap IoT devices sometimes are only in slave mode and cannot do master. But if you can be slave and master, then you can be part of this, let's say, warm network and like distribute the, the malware. Um, and I think there is, let's say, a sufficient fraction of popular devices. So it depends if it's in the operating system, then it would have to be like compatible iPhones or something. And then, I mean, if you just, there's not much diversity in iPhones. So if you just take like the top selling iPhones or something that also would work on the chip base on Android, you have more diversity, but still, if you would say you just take the, uh, pick the top Samsung and Galaxy uh, and maybe the Pixels or something, um, yeah, that could work. So Jan actually uncovered uh, vulnerability um, in the Android Bluetooth daemon, and that one would have been vulnerable, and it was fixed in February. I mean, still, yeah, so you couldn't infect like 100% of devices, but considering that you have your Bluetooth on and walk around and so on, that would be a threat still. So the reason why I think people, would, people wouldn't build it is um, how do you control it? Because then you need to have some communication over the internet or something like, how do you do like a command and control server for a Bluetooth worm in, in a way that is like stealthy and really, <laughs> I don't know. So I think it's really more, the, the bigger threat is uh, stealthily taking over nearby, nearby devices or like hacking someone uh, or like going next to an office train station somewhere where you know like interesting people are and taking over their devices. But I think even if it's vulnerable, I think um, this is nothing that people would build. But I mean, maybe someone builds it someday, yeah. so I won't build it because, uh, well, I, I wouldn't, but I mean, maybe someone is crazy enough to do this, right? <laughs> it's just true. I mean, you could potentially just do it without a financial motivation uh, just to see if it works or something. Yeah. Um, so uh, switching uh, gears just a little bit, uh, did you guys report this to vendors? Like, how was how did that communication like turn out? Was it positive? Was it negative? Was it tell me? Yeah. So the uh, the very first report about this denial of service mm -hmm. was in August last year. So that's like a year ago, and I think they didn't really take it serious because it was just denial of service, right? And even if you have denial of service with an operating system reboot, it's like nothing that you could really control, right? So like writing FF to one register, it reboots, okay, but who cares because you need RCE first, it's just, it's, it's hard to control. Um, and interestingly, in September that year, um, the iOS 13 update came out and it actually mentioned uh, Jan, Francesco and me. So, and so Jan was working uh, mainly on Frankenstein. I also worked a bit on Frankenstein and uh, the coexistence was what I did with Francesco. So I was like, okay, if they also mentioned Francesco and me, they should have fixed it, but they didn't. So I was a bit confused that all the names were mentioned there in the iOS 13 update. And also a month is a bit too short and everything that they patched, but silently already before was the enhanced inquiry response issue. Um, and then like I poked them from time to time, did you already patch it? Why didn't you patch it and so on? <laughs> and uh, at uh, 36 C3 on stage, I also um, showed that this is still unpatched and so on. Um, and uh, they still didn't patch it. And back then I already had in mind, so that, that was when I already called Francesco and said like, in January, we are going to build a uh, speculative transmission. So that was, I was like, please get things in that direction of attacks uh, fixed. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and then end of January, I actually knew that this is probably unpatchable. And that was uh, when I sent Apple that email, you know why Broadcom didn't send you a fix because it's unpatchable. <laughs> and they were like, what, what are you telling us? Um, <laughs> and yeah, so th at least, so that, that means like Broadcom and also like some of their customers got like some some notice already in January uh, about those things, like that they are broken. And I mean, also like the ones before, just about denial of service. And then I was building a few more POCs beginning of March because I was very busy in between, but that were like the, the final proof of concepts, like that there is even this RAM sharing and that it's exploitable and stuff like this, which I mean, Broadcom should have known it already. Um, and they already introduced this, this one patch that you no longer can write uh, to the Bluetooth RAM after driver initialization, that one was already pushed to devices somewhere around March. 
Uh, so this is like the thing that they did against it and that they could easily do uh, because they were like informed quite a long time before. And then in March, when all the proofs of concepts were also like easy to run, running and so on, um, then I also started informing the other vendors um, who I found to have uh, coexistence in their data sheets mentioned. So it's probably not everyone who uses it, but at least people I know that they use it. So this is something that like if, if other people were going to go look at other chipsets, uh, the coexistence is what they'd be looking for, uh, for a similar style of vulnerability. Might be something, yeah. So I'm not sure uh, how it is with all the other devices, but it's definitely existing in a couple of devices yeah. and, and that, all proprietary. <laughs> and that, that coexistence is controlled by that one, uh, was it CC10 chip? I, I, I forget the, the name of the chip. It was, it was the microcode portion that... Uh, um, ah, the D11, you mean? Yeah. Yes, that's yeah. the D11. Yes, it's controlled by this low-level stuff because it must be real-time. So it's an arbitration between the Bluetooth and the wireless, and uh, the wireless need to run this uh, into the lowest part of the stack that is uh, directly on this uh, microcontroller. Could you... Is there, is there anything else about that microcontroller that you want to talk about or share with people that are watching right now? Well, I think that it's very interesting uh, if you can uh, have the ability to hack this because uh, it's the uh, part that uh, uh, can decide what to transmit and whether to the receive the frame should be pushed to the host. So it's very interesting because you can also develop a very small stack over there and uh, the behavior of this stack would be completely uh, not uh, detectable by the host. So there is no way for the host to understand what the U-code might do. So if you find a way for change in the U-code over the air, then, wow, that's uh, amazing what you can do. But So is, is it something that could, like, proactively drop packets with, like, a magic value yeah. or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For this test that we were doing with the coexistence, we were uh, sending command to the wireless interface over the air and the U-code is the D11 core is uh, receiving them, then dropping them and changing the configuration of the wireless interface. This is totally unnoticed by the host. Uh, that's <laughs> awesome. Um, uh, what, what are the next areas that you guys are looking into for uh, like future research? Do you have anything already lined up? Anything you can talk about? <laughs> Probably the, the can talk about is the part, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, obviously like wireless security, but, uh, yeah. yeah. So there will be stuff coming up. Wow. Um, so I will definitely do further research. Um, and I mean, Francesco has been doing this for so many years. Probably <laughs> nobody else is like questioning what he's going to do in the future when he has doing it for the, uh, last 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, fair enough. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm running out of questions. We do have a couple more people that are, are typing now. Um, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, we've got a few moments. Is there anything that you guys want to talk about proactively that we haven't already covered? Um, I mean, so something that, that is uh, kind of interesting is that, like, people currently, like, also if you look into the first YouTube comments of uh, of the talk, it's like they are, like, you are just publishing this because I don't know, there is this exposure notifications for Corona and stuff like this. But actually, uh, we have been working on this, I mean, since much longer time than this. So it's, it's nothing that's like connected to Corona or something in that sense. Um, and also I think like for average people who just keep their system up to date and just use it, um, I don't think that it's like, a big threat in that sense. I mean, of course, like if you go on DEF CON where a lot of hackers are around you, you might want to disable Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, but like disabling Wi-Fi also has been a well-known practice in the past. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's... It, in, in your you experience, need to be in the bar. In your experience, does disabling like Bluetooth and Wi-Fi in the device actually turn off the full radio? <laughs> it doesn't turn off the chip. But yeah. um, it disables the whole stack usually in a way that you cannot establish active connections anymore. It depends a bit. But so, yeah, I mean, of course, like switching off your device if you don't want it to be hacked is uh, a good practice. Mm -hmm. 
probably even taking out the battery. Uh, it, it really depends. It really depends on your on your level of paranoia, of course. But um, right. so yeah, so those those people who who uh, are afraid because they have like. I don't know if you if you have something on your smartphone that's like worth uh, one hundred thousand bucks or something, then maybe uh, consider being hacked because this is like the range where the exploits for those devices start, right? So, <laughs> um, yeah, so that's probably the the threat model here, and I I don't think that like I mean until someone writes that Bluetooth form, who knows? Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that until then like uh, Bluetooth would be the preferred way to hack people. Um, what I still don't like about like, or how, how all this stuff like goes is that, uh, still Wi-Fi and Bluetooth are like, I mean, they have been exploited back in 2017 very publicly mm. and they are still very insecure. And that's, that's the part here. Like they have been insecure for years and there's, I mean, some things are happening, but really vendors and so on, they, they really need like some motivation to fix stuff even further. And so I wouldn't really say like we are making it more insecure. It's really like kicking them somewhere and saying like, please, please fix it. Please make it better. Yeah. Like we have seen like at least some improvements within the Broadcom firmware. It's still not super secure, but it's secure after the things that happened in 2017. And yeah, so I hope mm -hmm. to move it a bit more in this direction. Do you, do you have a general feeling for like if there's any particular chips that are seen more secure than others, like they better coding practices or anything like that, or are they all kind of roughly the same? There are at least some that are more obscure than others. I mean, Qualcomm has their own hexagon DSP, which you can emulate, but um, there are, I think there's a disassembler plugin for Ghidra, which partially works, and then there is two for IDA, but they also don't support like all commands, then, then you just have this assembler and no decompiler, Gitra, you would also have decompiler. So it's really bad quality of those tools for uh, for Qualcomm. And then still last year at DEF CON, there has been a talk about Qualcomm Wi-Fi having a bug. And they so I, after the talk, I just went to them, asked like, how did you find it? They said, just like static reverse engineering. I was like, <laughs> with hexagon, <laughs> right? <laughs> but um, yeah, so not sure if if Qualcomm is more obscure or really more secure at least they have more people on security conferences mm -hmm. and but yeah it's it's hard to tell Fair. so i think in general if you have newer hardware then you have more security measures in it and like newer chips so if you buy like the most expensive google or iphone or whatever uh it's probably more secure than if you buy some uh, very cheap smartphone with cheap chips that didn't have so much money for development, but it's still no guarantee. So it just, it could have the budget to make it secure if they wanted to make it secure. It's no guarantee, right? <laughs> right. Fair. Uh, and uh, this is the last question that I, I think that we can take, and this one's uh, not directly about your presentation. Someone wants to know how you displayed your hand behind your presentation in the actual recorded video. <laughs> So um, that's actually a method that I stole from Daniel Crusoe, the uh, guy who did the Spectra. Mm -hmm. So for his lectures, he's using OBS um, and he has a white wall. I mean, I also have the white wall behind me, right? Mm -hmm. And then I point with my hand and this is the part that I'm filming. And so this, this part would be like behind the slide and in the slide I said, white as an opaque color color and then I put my hand up so behind it. So then I have the layers and I can do the the pointing, so this would be the pointing. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I'm sure some other presenters will appreciate that touch. Um, okay, uh, well, that's uh, all the time that we have for you. Uh, thank you both for joining us for the QA session. Thank you both for uh, getting content into the virtual DEF CON, and um, yeah, have a nice day. <laughs> thank you, too. Take care. Thank you, too.